They lie somewhere within the realm of the paranormal, while checking many of the criteria that we associate with being cryptid in nature. Some say they are the embodiment of evil, sinister in appearance, and omens of danger to come if not the arbiters of said misfortunes. Though innocuous at first glance, it's when you see those abysmal voids staring back at you that you know they aren't there to sell you mint thins. We are, of course, talking about the infamous phenomena of black-eyed kids, and the following is a collection of first-hand accounts of unfortunate run-ins with whatever they are. It almost felt like a dream. I woke up to my dog Lucy barking. She was upright on the bed where my husband and I were sleeping with our 22 month old daughter, staring out our door like an unknown stranger was out there rummaging around. I thought she was just freaking out over a house noise. We'd only had her for three months and she was still a puppy. It could have been anything. Our roommate, a creak from the house settling, the awning moving outside in the breeze, I wasn't too concerned initially. I decided the best bet would be to open the door and show her nothing was there. It sounds a bit silly, but it's what we do with our daughter when she gets scared and I figured it should work with a puppy too. I opened the door and she raced to the front door. She stood there, snarling at the door. It was an angry, violent growl, one I had never heard her make before. I looked groggily at her and opened the baby gate blocking the doorway, planning to open the door and show her everything was okay. The second my hand reached for the deadbolt, Lucy went wild. She started barking and jumping towards me and when I touched the metal she suddenly changed her temper. She whimpered and almost like she was afraid and backing down. As her mannerisms changed so did mine, I was not calm anymore. My heart was racing and sinking at the same time. I had been flooded with a mixture of fear and with dread. I looked through the peephole. I can't explain why I looked, but I did. Outside were two kids. One was just a smidgen shorter than me and didn't look much younger. I'm 21 and she looked to be 16 or 17. She was slender and pale. Her hair was a light shade of honey blonde and she wore it long about mid back with long thin blunt bangs in front that covered most of her eyes. She wore jeans, a light wash that's popular right now and a thin looking olive colored pullover style hoodie. She held the hand of a small girl who looked to be around three or four in the same style jeans and a button down ivory cardigan. The smaller one looked at the door shyly but had the same shade of hair tied back in a ponytail. She held a stuffed toy under her free arm and it was identical to one that my daughter has, as was their style of dress. Had it not been for the feeling of overwhelming dread and fear, I probably would have asked these children in and given them some tea or hot chocolate to get them out of the bitter cold. Something about them seemed off. At this point I hadn't made any noise. I hadn't shushed the dog or grumbled, nothing. I hadn't turned on any lights. These kids had no indication that I was at the door. The older one spoke. She had a voice that was mature, confident, strong, and accentless. She held her head tilted downwards and I couldn't see her eyes. She said, we have to use your phone. I stood frozen in fear. How did she know that I was there? She raised her head and faced me directly, and that was when I saw her eyes. There was a reason I couldn't see them through her bangs before. They were black, or midnight blue, or a dark, dark purple. They were otherworldly. She said, our mother is worried. As someone who has always been interested in creepy stories, I knew what she was the second she looked at me through the door. I have never been one to believe in these things. As a staunch atheist and skeptic when it comes to the paranormal, I 
had written off many a ghost story from friends or family members eager to tell their tale. I didn't believe it. Still, I couldn't rationalize my way out of this. I was standing with nothing but a thin wooden door between me and a black-eyed kid. There was no questioning what was right in front of me. I did not answer her. Slowly and silently, I backed away from the door, Lucy still cowering at my ankles. She kept talking. Just let us in to use your phone. I took another step back, and with that step, the tone changed. At first, she seemed polite, but when I took that step back, she became commanding, almost hostile. We're not going to hurt you. If we wanted to do that, we would have broken in. I'll ask again, may we come in and use your phone? Lucy snarled at the door, and I inched backwards, though something inside me seemed to be slowly pulling me back towards the door. It wasn't a physical pulling so much as a subconscious need to go back and let them in. I got to my room, covered up the window, locked the door, and sat there in the dim light of the nightlight. I heard her call me back to the door once more, and then, quiet. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I haven't slept right since. I know from reading about them that BEKs can't just come in without permission. I know they haven't hurt anyone, but I still fear I'll be the exception. When I told my husband, he said it was just a dream. He keeps telling me to forget it, but this lingering feeling of sadness this dread when the house is silent at night, this fear of a knock at the door, this tells me otherwise. I was riding the bus back home from work. It was about 1 a.m. I'm a security guard and often work odd hours. So I'm sitting there and this guy gets on and sits across from me. He was wearing a suit, had a briefcase, and was basically a regular looking guy in his 20s. What struck me about him at first was that he was chewing a cigar, not smoking it. You can't smoke on the bus. So I was just looking at him while he stared out the window and chewed his cigar and all of a sudden he turned and looked at me. His eyes were pitch black just as you described. My heart started beating like a madman and I was starting to panic and I had no idea why. I was just pants shittingly terrified of this guy. Then he grinned at me and his teeth were all covered in tobacco bits and brown juice, the cigar clamped between them. I almost screamed, but instead I had the presence of mind to just get up and take the seat right behind the driver. I calmed down a bit after that, but I kept an eye on that guy. He ended up chatting with some girl that got on and they were still talking when I got off. I later convinced myself that he was just trolling me having fun with a pair of contacts. Now I wonder. This is so funny. I'd never heard of BEKs before my incident so I come on here to post my story and the first story I see is about a BEK. How weird. Let me preface this by saying, I am by no means a writer, just a domestic engineer living in North Texas. Also, I don't believe in the paranormal, ghosts, demons, aliens, whatever. However, I did have an event happen to me this Halloween and I have to admit, it has me scratching my head. This is my first post on Reddit, and I'm sorry to say I'd never even heard about it until yesterday. I told my best friend about my incident, and she's an avid reader of No Sleep, and she told me if I didn't post it, she would, so here I am. Anyway, hope you like it. So it had been a slow trick-or-treat night in our neighborhood that evening, which is pretty odd in and of itself. We usually have kids from different areas dropped off in hours and have a constant parade at our door. That night, I'd say we had no more than eight or ten groups of kids come by the entire night. It was about 9.30 and 
my husband and I were sitting in our family room watching some of those ghost shows based on supposedly actual events. Like I said, I don't believe in that stuff, but I do like a good ghost story now and then, and it was Halloween and all. We hadn't had any activity at the door in over half an hour, and it was getting late, so we decided to turn the porch light off and let our dog Chloe out of her crate. Chloe is an American bulldog and is very docile. We only put her in her crate because we're afraid she'll try to get out and play with all the kids and didn't want to have to chase her down the street. Also, we didn't want her to scare any of the kids because she would look a little intimidating to the younger kids. So I turned the outside light off, let Chloe out, and she followed me back to the couch and lay down by my feet. It was getting close to 10 p.m. when my husband decided that he had had enough fun for the night and was going to go upstairs, take a shower, and get ready for bed. After all, it was Thursday and he still had to get up early the next day. My teenage son was out with his friends at a local haunted house and wasn't expected back for another hour or so, so that left me alone on the couch with Chloe. Now, just because I don't believe doesn't mean those shows don't freak me out a bit. And being alone now watching, I'd have to say I was a bit on edge as it were. It wasn't long after I heard the upstairs water from the shower turn on when there was a light knock, knock, knock at the front door. My initial reaction was, what the hell, really? It's almost 10 o'clock, go home. But soon, an uneasy feeling came over me. Why the knock? Our doorbell glows and in the dark and without the porch light on, it would be extra obvious to anyone there. I paused. I couldn't really just ignore it. Our front door has a big beveled glass panel and anyone right there at the door could see in enough to see someone was in the family room watching TV. It would be pretty rude of me to just sit there and not answer it. Knock, 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 again from the door. I glanced down at Chloe and she was gone. My gaze followed her usual path to the front door, expecting her to be on her way there as she normally does. Nothing. She was not there. I stood up to look around the next room better and found her, crouching by the back door like she was wanting out. However, she never asked to go out like that. She always comes and licks my hand or puts her head on my knee. This was totally out of character for her, and I have to say heightened my anxiety. Chloe, great, I said. She just turned back to me like, hell no lady, ain't moving. I yelled up to my husband, but if he was already in the shower, I knew there was no chance of him hearing me. Knock, knock, knock. About that time, a car drove down our street and cast just enough light on the door to where I could see the silhouettes of two small children through the glass. I instantly felt relief. It was just some kids, probably a couple of my neighbors on their way back home that wanted to stop by and show me their costumes or something. I headed to the door and looked back to make sure Chloe wasn't going to follow. What a great watchdog, I thought to myself as she just sat there. I turned on the porch light when I got to the door and sure enough, I could see through the glass that it was a couple of pretty small kids. A little late for such young ones, I thought, and I began to wonder about what kind of parents would let their kids run the streets that late at night. I only opened the door enough to where I could block Chloe's escape if she decided to grow some balls, which is only about two feet. What struck me immediately as odd was the kids weren't wearing any costumes. They were in normal street clothes. Also, no customary trick-or-treat either. I began to feel very uneasy again. It was a girl and a boy. The girl to my left was older, I'd say about 11 or 12. I could tell she was blonde, but I couldn't make out any distinct features as our lights are from high above and on columns at the front of the porch so most of the light was coming from behind them. I had not opened the door wide enough for any light from inside to hit them directly. The boy was younger, about a foot shorter, I'd say eight or nine, and looked to have light brown hair. The girl very politely spoke up. Ma'am, can we please come in and use your phone to call our mom? As she spoke, something in the pit of my stomach was telling me something was wrong. What kid, even at that age, doesn't have a cell phone of their own these days? 
I couldn't remember the last time I had anyone ask to use my home phone. Um, hun, don't you have a phone of your own to call your mom on, I asked. This was when things really got weird. Both kids turned to look at one another like they were going to say something to one another, but neither ever spoke. They both turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my cell phone battery doesn't have any charge left in it. Can we please come inside and call our mother? We're alone out here and my brother is scared. I have to admit, there were two competing feelings going on inside me. The first, that of a mother's heart that wanted to help these two children get to their mom. The other, a sinking fear in my gut that was keeping the other feeling at bay. It was then that I noticed that during this short conversation, I had already opened the door a few extra inches, which I was completely unaware of doing. I stopped. Honey, why don't you give me your mother's number and I can call her myself. Another pause and they again looked at one another. After a short moment, they turned back to me and the girl said, Ma'am, my little brother has to use your bathroom. Can we please come inside while you call our mom? And with that last statement, the little girl moved closer towards the door like she was just going to walk on in by me. As she did, she stepped into the light coming from inside the house and I got my first real look at her. Solid, jet black eyes. That's all I could see. That motherly instinct was gone and replaced by terror I don't think I have ever felt in my life. I could feel every hair on my arm and back of my neck standing at attention. I closed the door to where just my face was able to stick out. The little girl stopped and again pleaded, Please ma'am, we're really scared and alone out here. We have to come inside. Please help us. Then like on cue, both kids began to whimper and cry. That's when the fear took over and I shut and locked the door. I'll call your mom if you give me your number, I shouted through the door, but I'm not letting you in my house. I could still see them standing there on the porch, just staring at me through the beveled glass pane. Part of me wanted to run upstairs to my husband, but the bigger part didn't want to lose track of where they were. That would have freaked me out even more to not know where they were. After what seemed like forever, but probably only a few seconds, I decided I'd call my neighbor that lives across the street. As I made my way to the side table by our couch to my phone, I glanced at the back door. Chloe was nowhere to be found. We later found her in our guest room under the bed. When I got to my phone and started to look for his contact info, it was only then the kids stepped away from the door and began to walk to the street. As they did, I walked to the door to get a better look to see where they went still not calling my neighbor. If you get close enough to the glass, you can see out enough to make out people's shapes, but you can't see much detail. Of course, standing that close to the door would make you pretty obvious to anyone outside looking in. From the door, I could see that the kids were still standing under the street lamp nearest my house, staring at me. As I lifted the phone to my ear after calling, only then did the kids start walking down our street. I met my neighbor out under the lamp once he was out there, but the kids were nowhere to be seen. Like I said, I don't believe in any of this stuff and had never even heard about black eyed kids before talking to my friend. What I really think, what I have to think, is these kids were just out yanking people's chains on Halloween night. But I will say this for them, they were good, really good at it. They scared the shit out of me and my dog. On March 17th, 2008, I had my one and only experience with a black eyed kid. Before my experience, I had never heard of anything having to do with the black eyed kids. I was 12. I was sitting outside of a hairdresser's in an old Chevy pickup waiting for my mom to get her hair cut. About 15 minutes had passed and I saw some kid walking back and forth along the sidewalk in front of my parked car. At first, I thought I recognized him as one of my friends from school so I banged on the front windshield until he looked my way. It was not anyone I knew. 
At this point, I was not scared at all. Not yet. The boy walked over to the side of my car and just stares. I think to let me have a good look at his eyes. To freak me out. Let me tell you, if you have never seen a black-eyed kid, you have no idea what to imagine. Pupils black as the night sky. The boy whispers, you must let me in. And then I locked the car doors and ducked down in the space below the seats. Five minutes later, he was gone. When my mother got into the car, she told me a boy with black eyes had come into the hairdressers and had insisted for my mother to give him the keys to the car. She refused. Thank God she did. This one time, early 2010, I was walking home from work and found myself escorting a young lady to her car. She asked me to escort her and hoping I'd talk her into a drink or two. I had already had a few myself. I'd get a number or possibly get laid that night. I'm not gonna lie, she was kinda hot. No shit though, she looked scared. I kept walking with her and was trying to at least coax out of her what she was so worried about. She would only comment about some really creepy looking kids who were following her. Being we were in downtown Seattle area, this could amount to anything. So we kept walking and talking. I kept looking behind us to see if these little creeps were in tow, but nothing popped out of the ordinary. Then she grabs my arm really hard and whispers, that's them. They were about half a block in front of us, just standing there and looking at her. So I do the prudent thing to do, which was cross the street. I make sure to lock eyes with the big one. I keep in mind once I get the lady to her car that I would give them an earful about being a couple of little creeps for scaring a lone woman in a metropolitan area. I didn't get scared or anything, but did notice something strange. They did not break eye contact with me. Mind you, I don't look like the kind of guy that you want to mess with. Honestly, it's an unconscious front since I'm a bit shy. My look reminds people of either a skinhead or a club bouncer. The black tanker boots and Van Dyke mixed with the above don't make me look like a people person either. People break eye contact with me constantly. These two kids didn't. That was a red flag for me. I finally got this woman in her car. She said thanks and I made sure to tell her where the local police station is at. The Seattle PD West Precinct was only about five blocks away from where we were. This really freaked me out. Yesterday I noticed my neighbor hadn't put out any of his Halloween decorations, lights, etc. The past two years I've lived next to him, he has gone all out for Halloween. I don't know him well, he's younger, single, but I know he likes kids, not in a creepy way. His brother and sister-in-law and their kids were always visiting him and he plays with his three young nieces and nephews out in the yard. So anyway, I got home from work and was walking up my driveway and I saw him outside and said something like, hey man. You better get your Halloween stuff up or that house up the street is going to beat you for best decorations. He kind of smiles sheepishly and says he's actually going to keep his house dark this year and just put out candy. I asked if he was going out of town, but he said no. Something happened last year that really scared him. Now I was concerned for my own safety if some weirdos were coming around our neighborhood, which is a pretty safe neighborhood with tons of young families living here. So I asked him what had happened. He said last year he had his brother's family over so they could trick or treat in the neighborhood since they lived in an apartment complex that didn't do much for Halloween. He had a bunch of kids come to the door like always. His family took off around 1030 and there were only a few older trick or treaters but by 1130 they were all pretty much done. So he was inside, watching TV, and the doorbell rings. He grabs the candy bowl and heads over. 
noticing that it's a little past midnight and that's pretty rude for trick-or-treaters to still be out. But then he notices he hasn't turned off all of his decoration lights yet, so his house is still a beacon. He swings the door open and is about to yell boo or something to freak them out, but stops dead when he sees the kids at his door. He said one was probably around 13 or 14 and the other 16 or 17, both boys. They weren't dressed up, but he remembers the older one was wearing a flannel checkered shirt. He was immediately overcome with uneasiness, like opening the door was a huge mistake. They just stared at him and he noticed they had really big irises and dilated pupils. He couldn't even see the whites of their eyes, so he figured they were contact lenses. He was frozen there, holding the candy bowl, like he couldn't slam the door in their face as much as he wanted to. So he nervously tries to smile at them, hoping they would break character and ask for candy or something. The younger one said they had gotten lost and needed to come in and use his phone. That was when he closed the door more than half on them and said, No, I'm sorry. And the older one said something like, Can we just wait in your house until our parents come get us? But by then he was convinced that his life was in danger and these kids must be high on something or intending to rob him and he just kept mumbling, No, I'm sorry, good night, as he inched the door closed and locked it. He told me that he was so freaking scared at that point that they were going to try to break in through one of the windows or something, but he looked through the peephole and they had turned to leave. He watched TV with the volume really low so that he could hear any sounds at all and he said he stayed up till like 5 a.m. because he was too scared to go to bed and drop his guard. The whole time that he's telling me this, I'm thinking, oh my god, this sounds so familiar just like the black eyed kids of urban legend. Then I thought, hey, maybe this dude is trying to scare me because after all, he does have the Halloween spirit. So I'm looking at him incredulously, but trying not to seem too gullible. So I'm like, man, this is really crazy. Sounds like the black eyed kids. He just looks at me blankly. The what? Is that a movie or something? And I said no, but told him to go look it up online. Like an hour later, I got a knock on the door and admittedly almost jumped out of my skin thinking it's a demon child. It was my neighbor, and his eyes were freaking huge. He swears to me up and down that he had never heard of the BEKs before, and it's so similar to what happened to him. So we talked a while longer, and I told him that Quite a few people probably know about the urban legend and it's probably just teenagers with black contacts trying to freak people out on Halloween, which would be genius by the way. But he said the fear that he felt was so primal and came over him the second he opened the door for them. Last night was like any other night. I was switching between listening to music and watching YouTube videos with one headphone in so that I could hear my infant daughter if she cries. That way my wife can get a full night's sleep. She works at 4 a.m. at the hospital every day. When I decide to go lay down in the spare bed in the baby's room, just as I doze off, I hear a thumping coming from the front porch. Startled at first, I open my eyes and scan the room. Realizing it was most likely my cat scratching himself on the front porch, I dozed back off. Then again, the thumping. Damn cat. I got out of bed to run him off the porch only to see he wasn't there anymore. Now that I was up again, I wasn't in the least bit tired. I figured I'd just get some tea and check Facebook while I'm up. Maybe finish the web series I had been watching on YouTube. A few minutes into the video, I felt a sudden urge to look up at the kitchen window. There they were. The tops of two short statured people's heads cresting the stairs just above my window frame. The people were just short enough not to see in the window but I could see out. I heard no footsteps on my porch as my stomach turned, but the knock 
The knock was a steady, hollow thump. Very same thump I had just blamed my cat on. Deciding it was best not to answer, I shut my laptop and crept by the door back to the baby's room. I assumed it was some of the people from the low-income housing across the road from me that were high or hiding from the cops or maybe looking for my cousin who stays with me often and has many friends over there. The last thing I needed was to try to explain to two stoners that I was trying to sleep even though it was 2 a.m. It wasn't until I got to my daughter's room that the creepiness set in. The thump had moved from the kitchen to the bedroom windows, both windows, a room apart thumping in perfect time. These stoners were going to wake up my daughter if I didn't run them off now. Pissed off, I went out to the kitchen, unlocked and opened the door ready to run around the side of the house and kick some little idiot's ass. It happened then. Standing there looking up at me were two 10 or 11 year old boys. Feeling of dread and the smell of mold almost made me vomit. The smaller of the two then spoke. May we use your telegraph? Huh? I just stared blankly at these boys, horrified of what I then realized. Their eyes were pitch black. He asked again to use my telegraph. There wasn't a sound to be heard. No crickets chirping. No dogs barking. No cars driving by. Nothing. I tried to play it cool and ignore the fact that he didn't say telephone or bone or cell. Anything that would have made any sense of the situation and calmly replied, I don't have service at my house, sorry. The expressions on their face turned to rage as I finished my sentence. Swiftly, I shut the door and locked it as quickly as I could and stumbled back to protect my daughter. I picked her up from her crib and held her close. The fact that she didn't wake up freaked me out the most, but I managed to gather my senses enough to make sure she was still breathing and warm. Everything seemed okay with her. The thumping on the windows was back. I dropped to the floor as close to the wall as I could and held my little girl in my arms and wept like a child. I felt helpless and afraid. I lied there for what felt like hours and hours, crying and shaking until I heard it. My wife's alarm clock. The thumping stopped the instant the alarm went off and I crept into the master bedroom with the baby. What is wrong with you? My wife asked. I just had a bad dream, is all I can mutter out. Okay, well, give me the baby so I can feed her before work. I handed my wife the baby and she fed her like any normal day. I turned on every light in the house and made coffee for her. For some reason, just having her awake calmed my nerves enough to pretend like nothing happened. I walked her out to her car nervously with my baby in my arms. I asked her not to leave until I walked back in the house. She was put off by the request, but did so to humor me. Once I was safely in the house, I locked the door again, and in the house, I sat horrified until she got home. I insisted we go to the next town over and stay the weekend at my brother's house. And here I sit, horrified while she sleeps in the guest room with my daughter, wondering why they stopped when the alarm went off. I think I know the answer. I was aware of PEKs. She wasn't. Every story I've read about them is from someone who already knew about them. Maybe, just maybe, knowledge of them existing is the only reason they visit. I'm afraid, and I am sorry. The incident took place about 13 years ago. I had just moved to a new city with my wife. We were small town newlyweds from the Midwest. We moved cross country to one of the biggest cities in the Southwest so that I could attend graduate school. Being naive and new to city living, I habitually answered the door without a second thought. Never again after this. The first thing that should have tipped me off to the peculiarity of this situation was the fact that someone was knocking at six in the morning. 
The second thing that should have dawned on me is this kid had to reach over a rather tall patio gate to unlatch and open it. The knock at the door was startling. My wife and I were getting ready for work, a pretty normal routine. The moment I opened the door, I was overtaken with an inexplicable sense of fear. To this day, I can picture him. Teenager, average height, average build, knee-length black leather coat, short black hair, and sunglasses. The sunglasses at 6 a.m. struck me as odd and even more odd. He was eating an apple. He was very polite and asked if he could come in and warm up. I said no, closed the door, and slid the security chain into place. A moment later, another knock. I opened the now chain door and before I could speak, he asked again if he could come in and warm up. No, I replied and attempted to close the door. Before the door could shut, he put his hand out, stopping the door on his hinges. He looked directly into my eyes, still wearing his sunglasses, and said, Can I at least get some ketchup for my apple? Screw that, I replied, albeit a little confused. Get the hell out of here. My wife is calling the police. He takes a moment to let this information sink in, lowers his glasses, revealing eyes as black as obsidian and says, No, you won't be calling anybody. At that moment, I forced the door closed, locked it, and called out to my wife. She is scared shitless hiding in the bedroom. All jacked up on adrenaline, I ripped the curtains back to look out the window next to the door. And he's gone. Absolutely no trace of him. I go out on the patio and check the gate, and it's still latched from the inside. That was so screwed up, I think to myself. And as I turn to enter the house, I notice a half-eaten apple lying on the ground. I'd be lying if I told you I didn't know about black-eyed kids before this happened to me last summer. I definitely did. Now, in the moment, that idea never crossed my mind. But afterwards, hell yes. And the thought led to all kinds of regret I realize is stupid, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you about my neighborhood. I live in a poor part of town. A bit ghetto, a bit of the barrio, a bit of the lower economic class of a cross-section of races. It's L.A. The apartment complex spans a short block. It's dusty brown like the desert we live in. It's got two pools, lots of little Mexican children, and for the most part, a pretty friendly population. I am a destitute writer trying to make it in Hollywood, so I spend my free time writing. When this happened, I was working mostly in the mornings and afternoons. I would get home, hit the gym, and then settle in for an evening in front of the computer. It's pretty common for the evenings in the summer to be chaotic around our apartment complex. Kids playing in the pool, the ice cream man pushing his cart up and down the sidewalk, women talking outside the laundry room. Hey, I do my own laundry, but I'm pretty much the only guy I see here doing it. You know, nice, low income but pleasant. Like a mixed race 21st century version of a 50s sitcom. And people knock on the door, sometimes to borrow something. I cook, so neighbors pop by to find out the origins of the great aromas wafting from my kitchen window. Sometimes for a little help working on a broken down car. But mostly, it's kids selling candy bars or Christmas wrapping paper. Or jittery tweakers selling magazine subscriptions. Or Mexican men selling bootleg DVDs. Lots of Jehovah's Witnesses. Because it's hot out, I leave my windows open. AC isn't cheap, and I've got no money, remember? Hoping for the cross breeze. That means, though I can't see anyone from where I sit and work, I can hear them very clearly as they walk up to my door. When I hear someone knock, I answer it. Besides buying the occasional candy bar, I smile, politely decline, wish them a nice day, and send them off. No big deal. That evening, it was quiet which was strange in and of itself. I should have at least been able to hear the distant sound of ranchero music. 
I heard a couple of people walking up to my door. I am not the first apartment in the courtyard, so usually I hear the salespeople as they knock on my neighbor's door and work their way around to me. Not this time. Whoever it was walked right up to my door and knocked. I got up to answer it, reaching for the door handle when a chill went through my body like I have never experienced. A cold tightness in my chest. I halted my hand movement towards the door handle and placed it flat on the door as if I was feeling for heat from a fire. I have a peephole on my door, but it never crossed my mind to use it. I stood there with my hand flat on the door and listened. They knocked again. I don't scare easy, and I wasn't exactly afraid, but I was having a visceral experience all over my body. A base fear reaction. Just like I had heard them, they had heard me move to the door. They knew I was inside. Yes, I said. Who is it? The boy's voice answered. We need to use your phone. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I started laughing. I stress laugh when I am in pain or under pressure. They hear me laughing and neither of us moved for about a minute or two. A really, really long minute or two. They finally walked away. Not to any of the other eight doors within 15 feet. Not to ask anyone else. Before they could have gone more than a dozen yards, curiosity reasserted itself and I yanked the door open, running after them to see who it was and where they were headed. The courtyard of my complex was completely empty. Afterwards, I thought the experience fit the stories about black-eyed kids and I kicked myself for not opening the door. Coming face to face with black-eyed kids. How cool would that have been? But then I remember that feeling. My skin crawling and that certain knowledge in me that at that moment, there was no way in hell I was opening that door at the time. It was a cold October evening, not too far off from Halloween. I remember sitting in my room, playing the original Sukoden. The evening was creeping slowly, so I decided to go to the corner store. It was only three blocks. It shouldn't be too much trouble, right? During my walk, I see the normal. The occasional person putting up Halloween decorations and kids playing in their yards, but this story is about something far more sinister. I remember seeing two teens about age 14 knocking on a door asking to use the phone, which of course I thought was weird because most teens these days have phones. As I kept walking, they stopped and stared at me for a short moment. I felt the blood in my veins chill. I felt so creeped out, I hurried to the next block. The next block seemed fine until I looked behind me and saw the two teens were following me. I took off sprinting to the store at that point. I saw the sign for the store and relief washed over me. I opened the door and I told the cashier about what happened on the way here. He looked at me slightly creeped out and told me a story about how this happened to him in his hometown. How they found him on the day that he left and they asked for help in an emotionless voice and told me to never agree to help. He told me another story, but at that point, I was no longer paying attention because they were standing at the door, asking to be let in. The cashier freaked out and locked the door. The teens never seemed to waver or leave. They wouldn't step away from the door. It had been an hour. The cashier and I were ready to fight our way out, but instead, he took me out the back. The one teen came around the back just as the door shut behind us. Can you help me, is all he could say. He was closing in on us and his eyes. They were black as a starless night. They were peering right into my soul. I couldn't help but gaze into his eyes. The terror. I can't remember too much of what happened next, but I do recall the sounds of struggling. When I came to, the cashier was struggling with both teens. He was calling out for me to help. 
I ran towards them, grabbed him by the collar and pulled him between the two and knocking them over in the process. I didn't look back until I was near my house. The cashier was gone, but the teens were still following behind. I ran into my house, closed all the blinds and turned the music up. I got lucky that day, but I'm not sure how long I can keep out of their grasp. I tried to find and thank the cashier who saved my life that day, but he didn't show up for work after that. I asked his boss and he told me he called over the phone and quit. He said he was moving. To this very day, I sometimes feel the fear of those eyes watching me as I drive to work. I sometimes will look out my window and I swear I see them watching my house from a couple blocks away, waiting for their next chance. I helped them once. Never, never, under any circumstances do it. I'm not sure what they do, but it feels as if they are ripping your soul out. They get really close to you and you get amazingly drowsy. If it weren't for my girlfriend showing up mid-invasion and kicking them out, I probably would be dead. I didn't even see the black eyes until I'd let them in. They're getting smarter. All right, for a bit of scene setting. In 96 or 97, I lived in a fairly old terraced house with a cemetery at the end of the road. Cliche, I know, but it's an important detail. Nothing remarkable about the house or the area. It was just convenient for college. Anyway, I was up late one night on the PC in my bedroom, which looked out onto the street. It was about two or 3 a.m. For whatever reason, Probably to give my eyes a rest, I wandered over to the window and looked down the road in the direction of the cemetery, although it was too far down the street for me to see. Then I saw three people walking slowly down the road. I could see that they were quite old and appeared to be dressed in funeral clothes, which, given the hour, was weird. There were two women and a man. I'd put their ages at about 80 and the woman in the middle was being steadily guided by the other man and woman. As they came closer, I got the impression that she was upset. My first thought was that given their age, she had recently buried her husband and grief had caused her to behave slightly irrational, causing her to try to be out near the cemetery at that hour, and that the other two were friends, relatives, trying to look after her and get her home. Anyway, it was all interesting enough for me to carry on watching as they got closer to the house. Just outside the front of the house was a street lamp. I watched them as they made their way past, but when they got to the lamppost, they all stopped, and the upset woman in the middle looked up at me and grinned. This was when things got weird. The grin became a sort of grimace, and if there was any color in her face to start with, it was now dead white. At that point, I realized I was staring right into her eyes but her eyes were pitch black. Time sort of dilated. If you've ever crashed a car, the final split second before you make impact seems to drag out as you process more information than normal in that time frame. It was that sort of thing. I'm sure we only made eye contact for a second, but it felt like several minutes as my peripheral vision faded and I felt like all I could see was these two black holes in her face drawing me in. Although the distance between us didn't change, she somehow felt like she was coming closer, and I was kind of aware, although I couldn't honestly say I could see them at that point, that the two people with her were just continuing to look down the road as if frozen but waiting for this woman to finish whatever she was doing. I was suddenly hit with this intense feeling of dread and panic so I threw myself on the floor. As soon as I'd broken her gaze, I felt pretty stupid that this upset old woman who clearly needed help had spooked me so badly. So I looked out the window again, 
and there was no sign of them. It was the longest straight road, and the house was towards the middle, so Linford Christie would have trouble getting out of sight in the time that I looked away, let alone three octogenarians. Let me tell you a little about myself. I'm in my early 20s. I just moved into this apartment and I tend to live a very private life. I don't even have a Facebook account. I work during the day at a grocery store. Okay, so I'm walking up my flight of stairs to get to my apartment and I hear these kids laughing and then I hear them whispering. It was kind of late so I thought this was weird but I ignored it and walked into my apartment. I live on the third floor. I was getting ready to open my balcony door. It was really muggy in my apartment. I walk over to the door and pull my blinds and two kids are freaking staring back at me. I screamed and backed away, smashing my leg into the table. They were both in blue jeans and the oldest was taller, had a green t-shirt with white stripes and the younger had on a button up light blue shirt. The oldest one touched the sliding door. Hey miss, can you let us in? The younger one just kept looking around. I still just stared at them. I finally was able to say, how did you get on my balcony? I walked over to the door and noticed how excited the older one got when he moved closer to the entrance. Can you let us in? I wasn't thinking. I unlocked the door and when I looked up, their eyes, you guys, their eyes were black. The entire eye. I quickly locked the door and told them that I had to call the police because my door was jammed and I couldn't unlock the door. So I called the police. The oldest boy pleaded with me the entire time to let them in. The police arrived about an hour ago. They came in and walked the balcony. When they opened my balcony door, nothing was there. They looked down and saw two children that were running in the parking lot away from the building. The police took a report and said that they had to have had help getting up there and that they would question the neighbors. I'm freaking out. I'm crying. I don't want to stay here, but then again, I don't feel safe going outside right now. in a big city in South BC and it's 1.52 here as I type this. I had just got home from The Conjuring. Scary shit, I'm telling you. I was lurking on creepy Reddit and heard a knock on the door. I walked over confused because I live alone and I'm a recluse. As I approached the door, I felt pure terror. The feeling you get when you feel like death is imminent and you're facing your biggest fear. When I opened the door, I was shaking madly. I was staring into the face of a six foot three teenage girl. She was still four inches shorter than me, but I felt like I was about to faint. She asked if she could enter the premises because her mom had left town and she lost her keys. She claimed she needed a couch to sleep on and was cold. I blinked and screamed bloody murder, slamming the door in her face. I ran to my room and grabbed my revolver. Yeah, 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 I know, illegal. And I sat in the recliner, facing the door until I dozed off. When I woke up, I looked outside and she was gone. But the word, soon, was scratched weakly into the door. Reading the stories, I have always been skeptical. Stories, alleged first-hand experiences, hauntings, possessions, they're all well and good for a quick chill, a cheap thrill, something I read to get my heart rate up. Getting scared can be fun sometimes as long as you don't overdo it. Just a little something silly to get worked up about. 
In my lurking in books and on numerous sites on the internet, credible or not, I have come across many stories or accounts about ghosts, demons, the Jersey Devil, you name it. Recently, I found my way into stories about the BEK or black eyed kids. No, these children did not get a black eye from a fight. I don't believe there would be a soul out there with a backbone to try and attack these kids. No, BEK are kids, if that was not straightforward enough. Usually from all the accounts I've read in their teenage years, if they even physically age at all. Their eyes are pitch black, no pupils, no corneas, no white showing at all, just pitch black. They have olive skin and wear run-of-the-mill clothing as in hoodies. However, in a non-physical sense, they always bring with them an overwhelming sense of fear and dread. They are intriguing and when approached by them, again from all the accounts I've come across, it's like you are in a slight hypnosis, though you quickly snap out of it when your instincts take over, usually as you meet their eyes. Then there are the theories. The theories about what these PEKs may be. These theories range from lost souls to aliens to human hybrids and even to vampires, though the latter may be an extreme stretch to link the PEK to current social infatuations of vampires found commonly in young persons. In light of all this, I have always been a very fact-based person. If its existence was not apparent or the existence of the thing in question was not testable and verifiable to me, it did not exist. However, one night, one long, terrifying night which still haunts me to this very day, showed me the proof required to open my eyes and mind. My story begins when I left my mom's house. I had gone over to visit because my father, her husband of 63 years, recently passed away and mom wasn't taking it too well. I knew she needed support from her loved ones and I was more than willing to go visit and keep her company but it was getting late. My mom lives in the suburbs, tidy lawns, plenty of neighbors paved roads and even though it was nearly 11 p.m. when I left, the streets were extremely well lit by the streetlights who always had their safety and ease of mind at heart. These lights only lit the road though, and glancing across the street the houses were cast in an eerie shadow. Even a rather safe, charming little neighborhood can seem spooky and uninviting when cast in shadow. I admit I was terribly chilled. Sliding into my car, I revved the engine and waved to my mother who was standing in the doorway wrapped comfortably in a warm shawl. She waved back, her old and fragile arms shaking. I saw her mouth, be careful, then I smiled backing out of the driveway. I turned out of the neighborhood deciding to take the back way, the shorter way home tonight. In hindsight, that might not have been a good idea. I live a significant ways away out in the middle of the country in an old farmhouse I grew up in, which my father had left in my name when he and mom had moved out, into a place smaller, more easy to care for and affordable and social. He, my father, had always told me growing up, don't go out at night and always beware the devils. He was a strong believer in anything and everything paranormal, a very superstitious man and I always had to resist the urge to laugh at his words, but I knew he meant well. Driving down the dark country roads, there were no street lights, and the half-assed paved road was cracked and filled with potholes. The fields on either side of the road were empty, just blank stretches of overgrown grass and unattended shrubbery. The dark outline of the trees of the woods could be seen looming all the way across the fields in the shadowy horizon. One might have even seen a deer or two once in a while in those fields, but not tonight. The moon offered little light as the sky rolled with dark, threatening clouds ready to burst with rain or a storm at any moment. Sure enough, a few moments later the low grumble of thunder sounded, heavy and long. However, no rain fell just yet, much to my pleasure. 
I hate driving at night and I hate driving in the rain. But putting those two together would end badly. I just knew it. Accompanied by only the occasional roll of thunder, I started to feel a bit anxious. I can't explain it. I just felt shaken up. Probably because it was night and it could start raining. Or maybe I had been reading too many ghost stories and legends, and tonight seemed to reflect the mood of the stories I read almost obsessively. To try and calm myself, I flicked on my old car's radio and turned the old-fashioned knob back and forth, slowing down a bit as I attempted to find a station that came in clearly. Nothing doing. Weird. There was a broadcast tower right near here. It usually came in perfectly, clear as day. But still, nothing. The white noise and static of the blank station was doing nothing to appease my anxiety. I gripped the steering wheel tightly as more thunder boomed from the sky. Aggravated, I shut off the radio, gritting my teeth. Glancing down at the dashboard, I noticed I was nearly out of gas. Groaning, I searched the road for a sign for gas. As I was scanning the side of the road, I noticed from the corner of my eye, two figures walking on the side of the road, shrouded in shadow. They were walking slowly. One turned around, walking backwards, his or her thumb sticking out. I felt compelled to pull over, give them a ride, and I found my hands turning the wheel slightly, but I pulled back, realizing how stupid it would be for me to accept two random strangers in my car in the middle of the night on a backcountry road. I sped up and passed them, trying not to look at them as I did so, though I felt oddly intrigued by them. As I focused on the road ahead, it started drizzling, dropping my mood another level or two. Along with the rain, the thunder seemed louder and closer as the storm moved in. A few seconds passed until I gave into my compulsion to look at the two figures, and I glanced in my rearview mirror. It seemed as if the two were walking faster, and the one no longer had his thumb out, but it had to be my imagination. How would I be able to tell if they were walking faster or not? It was raining and dark. Looking back at the road, I almost missed a sign that alerted me of a gas stop up ahead. A sigh of relief passed my lips and I slowed down, looking for any indication of the stop, pushing the thought of the two figures out of my head. Soon, I was pulling into the gas station slowly as the rain started to pick up. The store was closed, but Luckily, they had a 24-hour gas pump service. That was good for me, as if they had not, I'd have run out of gas a few miles down the road. I shut off my car and hesitantly shuffled out of the metal shell and glanced over my shoulder, still not being able to shake that nervous feeling that had manifested inside me earlier that night. I stood under the light of the overhang, trying to figure out how to work the pump, which seemed so overcomplicated in the dim light and with my mind not being able to focus on the simple task. The rain picked up more, heavier and louder against the concrete of the gas stop as I finally was able to get the pump into my car, forcing my hand to stop it shaking. I had a horrible feeling that my shaking wasn't just because of the bitter cold night air. Suddenly, the overhang lights of the gas stop started flickering wildly, a couple going out altogether. It seemed as if the temperature dropped 20 degrees in just a few seconds as I glanced around, a sinking feeling starting to blossom in my stomach. As if in slow motion, I turned around facing back towards the road, the long, lonely road, and saw what I expected to see there. But even as much as I knew what I'd see, I still felt the drop of my stomach, the color draining from my face, and I breathed a sharp, cold breath forcefully as it almost caught in my throat. Across the street, the two figures were standing facing me. They started crossing the street slowly but surely, and I fumbled with the gas pump. It had only been a few moments, but it seemed as if the gas pump was taking its precious time. I was shaking hard now as thunder boomed once more and I looked back. The figures were now at the entrance of the gas stop and my breath was quick and shallow as I blindly shoved the gas pump back into its holder, 
not being able to tear my eyes away from the forms. As they drew closer, I became more frantic, even though now as they walked into the flickering light of the overhang, I saw they were just two teenagers. They looked ragged and frigid and soaked from the rain. I straightened up a bit, still terrified, but another compulsive feeling similar to the one I experienced in the car was bubbling, and I felt obligated to talk to these two, though I insisted to myself to just drive away, not to risk anything. They were extremely close now. At the next pump when I slid into my car, shaking wildly and I fumbled for my keys, cursing myself as I dropped them on the floor. Leaning down, I swept them up and sat back up. A cold, sickening feeling as I came face to face with one of the teens who had put his hand on my window, knocking slowly but forcefully. I rolled down the window a bit, just a bit, no bigger than to allow maybe a child's hand through. Before I spoke, he spoke first. The other figure standing in the background, still, but I could see something of a grin there on her pale face. Can you give us a ride into town? We miss the bus and don't have a ride. He spoke slowly and something about his voice made me shiver. A cold chill swept down my spine and I opened my mouth but no sound came out. Clearing my throat, I glanced at the dashboard and at the keys in my hand. I I'm sorry, but I'm not going into town, I stuttered, keeping my eyes down, not at the kids. However, the teenager knocked harsher and made me jump a little, as he insisted another time for a ride. I told him no once more and I looked up, trying to seem intimidating, which seems silly, trying to seem intimidating to a child, but... A horrible, chilling sight greeted me. I looked at the kid right in his eyes and gasped sharply, my back hitting my seat as I went to back away. He had eyes, oh he did, but they were blacker than night. Pitch black, no discernible pupils and no white whatsoever showing. Pure, black, deep, brooding and surprisingly intriguing, but... My fear got the better of me and I quickly turned the key and my engine revved to life. I thanked God, which I had never, ever done before this night, that my car had not stalled and as I went to pull away, the kid banged on my window with a pale fist screaming for a ride. I took off speedily down the road, apologizing to my father again and again that I had laughed at him, never took his warning seriously. After a few more minutes, I pulled into my driveway and right into my lawn in front of my porch. I didn't want to spend any more time outside than I already had and jumped from my car, leaving the car door open and ran inside, slamming the door and locking it, even going so far as to put a chair in front of the door in case someone or something tried to get in. Sinking into the chair in front of the door, I shivered uncontrollably and started to cry hiding my face in my hands as two dark figures stood at the end of my driveway. So, a month ago, my friend was talking to me about these creepy-ass kids who were hanging around his house. He seemed scared, like he was about to shit his pants and he doesn't scare easily. He said they always wanted to use his phone and wanted to come in, but he always said no. A week ago, he told me he was going to let them in and I really didn't give it any attention, but he's been missing ever since. I've gone over to his house, but it's empty and his cell phone number isn't going through. Does anyone know what happened to him? I've heard about BEKs just now and I don't know what they do. Is he alive? Please help, I'm seriously freaked out. It was one in the morning and I was a little late on walking my dog Dakota. She was a three-year-old German Shepherd and was very tame for a big dog. Not in my entire time having her have I seen her run up to anyone. She gets nervous around strangers. I live very close to a large park that leads into a hiking trail, 
There's a large area that's used as a baseball field and the big entrance into the wilderness surrounded by trees and darkness. Here is where I let Dakota off of the leash and follow behind her as she sniffs around trying to find a spot to do her thing. This night was different though. As soon as I take her off her leash, she jolts into high speeds towards the trail opening. I know many of you are judging me for letting a dog off its leash and trust me, I know I shouldn't do it but it's just one of those things you just don't tell people you do, like littering or U-turns. Plus, this was completely out of character for her, and all I could think was, if she goes in there and doesn't come back, I don't think I can go after her. I was not about to get lost in the pitch black darkness on a freezing cold night to get eaten by some mountain lions. I'd wait for her and probably call my roommate and tell him I'd be taking longer, but she didn't go in. She was about eight feet from the entrance when I see a tall, dark figure calmly walking out of the darkness. Anyone else would have probably freaked the hell out right there. Some creep walking out of the woods at this hour? Hell no, but I'm in pretty good shape. 6'5", and if anything, people are usually more scared of me than I am of them. Plus, the random weirdo isn't rare in LA even if this is a middle class, good suburban neighborhood. So I call for Dakota, but she doesn't move. I have never seen a dog literally follow someone with their gaze, never breaking contact. It just didn't make sense. That was where the uneasiness first kicked in, but it wasn't anything serious. It was just really strange. I started jogging towards her when I noticed it's a girl. About 17 to 20 years old, around 5'9", and from what I could see, she was stunning. Long legs, beautiful body, short dark hair almost reaching her shoulders in a tousled sexy kind of way. Her long messy bangs framed her face as she stopped walking to look at Dakota for a second. Couldn't make out her face really, but I didn't see a death pale girl in a white dress floating like your stereotypical dead girl. I saw a stunning girl in skin tight, dark jeans, boots, a dark leather jacket and from what I could tell, she had a light complexion but by no means did she look like a ghost. My first thought was, maybe if we can talk I can get her number but then I remembered this girl had just walked out of the hiking trail in the middle of the night. I started thinking about a documentary about female serial killers I saw once but even if she was a crazy person, I still have no idea how she could just walk around up here when the darkness was so thick I doubt you could see one foot in front of you. Even though there was something really off about all of this, when I saw her stop to look at Dakota again, I lightly said to her, don't worry, she's harmless, to which she completely ignores me and continues walking. I think, okay, I didn't expect someone who walks around in the woods in the middle of the night to keep a conversation going. I put Dakota's leash on, but she doesn't budge. All she does is take a couple steps towards the girl, then stops whenever the girl looks back at her. I think she likes you, I say, to which again the girl just looks at Dakota. All of this felt really weird, almost like a dream, like a light feeling in that silence that sounds almost like you're underwater. No matter how much I tried to act cool, this was not normal. So here I am, trying to get my paralyzed dog to budge while an intimidating, mysterious girl doesn't break eye contact with her. I was stuck between I'm so embarrassed and she's gonna pepper spray me when she takes one step towards Dakota and my dog has her tail between her legs and is whimpering like she's seen the devil. That's when I knew we had to go. If anyone knows when something is up, it's a dog. And as soon as this girl is walking again, I picked up my 60 pound dog by the stomach and started speed walking back. I probably looked like a total idiot, but I didn't care. Whatever dreamlike state I was in before had been completely broken by my dog's attitude. Everything inside me was telling me to go home. So I'm halfway across the field when I put my dog's leash on and set her down. She doesn't budge again. I think, are you freaking kidding me? I will drag this dog. 
when I almost threw up as I turned around to see this freaking girl standing on some bleachers not even 10 feet in front of me. I can see her face now in the light. I shit you not, this girl was beautiful, but her eyes were blacker than black. They filled all her eyeball. It was just two shiny orbs inside of two almost almond-shaped sockets. She looked completely different from the serious expression I could make out before. I freaking swear. I wanted to run, but something made me stay. I felt like I was so scared that I could hear the faint high pitch humming in my ears and my entire body felt heavy. I wanted to run more than anything. I could have thought, oh, a chick with some Halloween contacts, but... I cannot explain the feeling of absolute paralyzing horror I experienced without any rationalization. I didn't have time to. These feelings hit me like a freaking train and I hope to god I never feel as helpless and mortified as I did then. She was not human. She was not a regular girl. And to make things worse, this girl says in a sultry sweet tone that I'd expect to sound like something from beyond the grave. Does she bite? And still on defense mode, I think I managed to utter out my idea of no. I don't know if anyone else knows what I mean when I say I felt like as soon as I blinked again, she would be standing right in front of me, but she did. As soon as I finished saying no, she waited a couple seconds before saying, Do you live nearby? To which I was going to say no, even though I did, but as soon as I went to speak, she said, Did you drive here? And I started walking back, trying to distance myself slowly, and again, before I speak, she says, I'm going to need to come with you. You'll let me come with you. That's okay, right? It's okay. Don't be afraid. And with that... Dakota freaking books it as I start running like a scared child and my dog is right in front of me. I don't stop until I catch up with my dog. We're at the other side of the street and I take this time to turn around and make sure she isn't following me. She's calmly walking back, already all the way to the other side of the park where she was before. I called my roommate to meet me halfway with the car on my way back home and I have never walked my dog again after dark.